Well, thank you, John and Renee, for singing those songs, leading us in worship, reminding us that God is always for us. Well, we are in our final session of Fear Not, and uh, hopefully uh, you realize that we've covered a lot of ground in a short window of time, and hopefully uh, John and I have given you some practical tools in which to deal with our uh, battle against fear, because we all have a battle against fear at some time or another. Um, the least of which of these tools that we've given you, I hope, is the fact that we can be victorious in this battle against fear, uh, the unhealthy kind of fear. The healthy kind of fear, we know that has a proper place, and we want to keep that exactly where it belongs. That is a good thing. But the unhealthy kind of fear, we can be victorious over that. Um, however, there's another side of the victorious, uh, the victorious side of fear. Sometimes we call it defeat. At other times, we lessen it to just simply discouragement. We all have experienced those de defeats, those setbacks, those discouraging times when it comes to fear and other things in life. But I want to share with you an important fact that we must never, never, never forget. Any setback, any struggle that we might have with fear does not mean that we are a failure. We're human. Human beings have setbacks. We have failures. None of us are uh, beyond hope, and our failure means that we have a Redeemer, and He wants to redeem us. He wants to redeem our fear. He wants to redeem our struggles, and we have to just depend on Him to do so. So none of us are beyond hope. None of us are beyond the redemption that we have in Christ. And when it comes to fear, there's a tricky part. And I should have mentioned this at the very beginning, but I'm going to get to this in a little, bit, a little bit later about what Jesus did. People tend to remember the first and last thing you say, so hopefully you'll remember this. Fear is a heart issue. It is not a head problem. Do you realize that? Fear is an emotion. Fear is a heart issue. So fear can never be conquered by more information. Have you ever thought about it that way? We fear things, and, and it, it does us no good to tell people more and more and more facts, more and more information. Let me just give you more and more information, and you'll get over your fear. It doesn't work that way. Fear is a heart issue. We feel fear. fear. Fear is an emotion that we simply simply put, it means that we're human. And because we're human, God knows that we cannot conquer fear on our own with more information. That is the whole reason that he sent his son, his one and only son, to die on the cross for our sins. Because he knew we couldn't do it. We couldn't redeem ourselves, nor can we conquer fear on our own because we're human and we have those human limitations. There are times that we all experience this defeat and discouragement, and there are other times that we will have great seasons of victory over fear and, and uh, our sanctification becoming more like Christ. There are seasons in our life that we will, will ebb and flow in our becoming more like Jesus. Hopefully it's more seasons of positive movement and less seasons of negative movement. But either way, we know that we're going to have seasons that kind of give and take, that we'll have victory and we'll have setbacks. We'll have victory we'll have setbacks. It is because of that that we need to maintain what I'm going to talk about today, that Jesus is always with us. He's always with us on our life's journey. And because of the Holy Spirit, we have God with us all the time. So, since heart, the heart issue is fear, the only antidote for a heart issue is another heart issue, and that is the feeling. The feeling that most often we say is the feeling of safety or security or love. And so, the only thing that can conquer fear is, is the feeling of being secure, being safe, being loved by someone, and especially being loved by our Savior. That's what I want to talk to you about today. Let's pray together.
Father, I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you sent your son to die on a cross for our sins and that you promised that you would be constantly present and a constant helper and sustainer in our lives, in our life's journey. And I pray that you'll help us to trust those realities and that promise of your commitment to our lives as your people and as your church. And I promise, I, I thank you that you give us the promise to give us courage to walk more boldly in life and to know that you're always with us every moment, every step of the day, every season of life. In Jesus' name, amen. So up to this point, um, I hope that John and I have shared with you some practical ways that we can deal with fear and, and that we can identify both healthy and unhealthy fear. And the unhealthy fear is the side that we've been trying to focus on. You know, I, I dealt with the healthy kind of fear, the reverence, the respect, both of the Lord and other things that we should be fearful of. You remember that zip line thing that I did the first week? You know, and the healthy fear that some of us have of heights and other things. And those fears are a good thing. Those things save our lives. But the unhealthy fear causes us to, to shrink back. To not be as bold in our walk with the Lord, not to be bold in, in our confidence in the Lord, to realize that he's, to forget that he's with us. And so we know that we need to identify healthy and unhealthy fear. And that every fear has a proper place. It's in the hands of God. That he wants to take both healthy and unhealthy fear and deal with it appropriately. We talked about how that we can develop these habits of identifying and giving these back to God. And that any of us, as we do that, will have a greater success over our fear. And that when we add to those, those simple tasks, that the fact that the Holy Spirit wants to give us self-control, or better yet, spirit control over our feelings, that we can have victory over these things. Now, when we do those things, when we put those steps in place, it could easily, we could be like, you know, teenagers. We're invincible. We've got God on our side. We've identified unhealthy fear. We've given them back to him. So we are invincible when it comes to fear. But as adults, we know that oftentimes we feel anything but invincible. We feel defeated. We feel fear. We feel that we're all alone. And when it comes to the Lord, we're reminded, he reminds us over and over again in Scripture that we are never alone. Never alone. We are never alone. We are never alone. So today, I want us to look at three biblical stories. There could be, we could spend years looking at all the biblical stories, but I just want to pull out three biblical stories that point out the fact that God never leaves his people alone. He never leaves those who want to follow him alone. He is always with them. And last week I mentioned one of these stories. And so the first one I want to talk about is that Joshua and the promised land. Each of these stories are going to point out that we are safe, we are secure, and we are loved by our Savior. He cares for us. We are never alone in spite of what we might feel. Last week I talked about how that there was 12 spies that Moses pulled out of the crowd and one, one uh, spy from each tribe and they were sent into the promised land and 10 of, those tri 10 of those spies came back and they were fearful. 10 of those spies came back and they said there's giants in this land there's walled cities. We're like grasshoppers. We can never defeat these people. But there was two guys, Joshua and Caleb, and Joshua is one I mentioned last week, Joshua and Caleb, that they overcome, overcame their fear of what they saw and trusted the Lord. I want to mention Joshua today and what God did for him as he um, stepped into the leadership role. Most of you know that if you know your Bibles, Joshua is the one that God appoints to be the next leader in charge of the people of Israel, right? Now, I want you to think about that. Two million Jews that have left Egypt, 
that have been complainers, stiff-necked, um, less than easy to lead, and Joshua has just been given that commission. Those stories are found in uh, Numbers 13 and Numbers 14, but what I want you to do is I want you to turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 1. And I want us to see what God has to say to Joshua as he gets ready to step into this leadership role that Moses has carried for the last 40-some years. So let's look at Joshua, what the Lord said to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. That's pretty clear, right? Now, therefore, arise and go over to this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. If there was any man ever in history that had a reason to be fearful, Joshua, his moment has just arrived. Moses has been his hero. Moses has been his mentor. Moses has been Joshua's friend for more than 40 years. And God doesn't beat around the bush, and he, he just simply says, Moses is dead, and you're the guy. Wow. God doesn't hold back truth, does he? Think about this. Joshua has to take on the leadership role of two million plus stiff-necked people that, that didn't follow Moses real well. If you know your Bible, they rebelled against Moses several times. And God says, you get that role now. You get to be the guy that they rebel against. You get, to get, you get to be the guy that they don't want to follow, but they have no one else to follow. So they follow you out of spite rather than out of joy. Joshua gets that part. Moses has been their leader in all matters of religious, domestic, judicial, military, and civil concerns for the past 40-some years. He has walked with them. Moses has walked with them through the Red Sea, through wilderness, deserts, for all this time. And God says, and you're the new guy. You get to step into this role. I, I don't know about you, but if I was Joshua, the self-doubt, the fear, the intimidation... He had to be feeling, I'm no Moses. I didn't see you at the burning bush. I didn't see what you did in front of Pharaoh in the courtyard of Pharaoh. I didn't see those things. How can I possibly step into the sandals of Moses? How can I possibly carry his torch? He had to be fearful. He had to be intimidated. Because these people were rebellious people over and over again. Surely, he, if, if Joshua, if we could have gotten into Joshua's head at this, po at this point, I am wondering if Joshua wouldn't have said, um, excuse me, Lord, I didn't volunteer. Can I, can I say no? I know this is an appointment, but can I not reject this appointment? Can it be Caleb? I mean, he also had fear. I mean, put him on the, on the line. Can I, can I say no to this? Often we read into things in the Bible that, that are just not there. I don't see Joshua real excited about this appointment. Because look what the Lord says to him. Joshua, you're the leader. You're the new guy. You're the one that's going to carry them into the promised land. And the Lord says to Joshua, as we continue to read, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I will give to you, just as I promised to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. By the way, they don't possess that amount of land until the time of Solomon. Joshua didn't understand how big a territory God had just promised him. It was one thing. You're going to be the leader. 
And you're going to take more land than Moses ever thought about taking. Then he says to this, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you and will not leave you or forsake you. And just so that Joshua could know that God was promising this, three more times he says, be of great courage. Be, don't fear. Don't be afraid. Be of good courage. And he continues to tell them. And if we drop down into verse 9, he says this. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? There, here, here's the line. Do not be frightened. Joshua, put away your fear is what he's saying. And do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. See, we so often think Joshua was so excited. He gets to be the guy. Now he gets to be Moses' you know, second. He was happy with second. Now he's got to be number one. He's got to be the guy. And I don't, think Mo, I don't think Joshua is really excited about that. And that's why we read Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, that God has to keep telling him, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And if the great leader, the man of faith, Joshua, who was going to lead, eventually lead these people into the promised land to take them into the land that he had promised Moses, if he didn't have a fear problem, I mean, he does have a fear problem, obviously. None of us are immune to this fear either, right? None of us are better than these guys, Moses and Joshua. He says, you're not going to be alone. I will be with you always. Everywhere you step, I will be with you, he says. And before we, need to, before we leave the story of Joshua and the people of Israel, I need to point out something that the Lord clearly demonstrated in the first verse of this chapter. He identified Moses as the servant of the Lord. Very few precious people in the Bible are given that honorable title. Very few. Joshua has to wait until his death at 110 years old before God says, he is my, my servant. Joshua serves the Lord faithfully all throughout his life. And it's only at the end of the life, at the end of his life, that he is called the servant of the Lord. Isn't that something? And yet you and I, if we will yet serve the Lord, if we will serve the Lord right now, we can be called the servant of the Lord. Isn't that special? That we can be a servant of the Lord here and now today if we choose to serve him. I think that's pretty amazing. Let's go on to the next story. Let's jump over into the New Testament and talk about Jesus and his disciples. As I said at the beginning, most people remember the first and last thing that someone will say to them. And today I want to look at the last thing that the Lord had said to his disciples. found in Matthew chapter 28, the very last verse in Matthew 28. At the very end of that, we read about the Great Commission. And how the Lord gave his disciples a job to do as he left this earth. And says, okay, now that I'm going, this is your job. This is what I want you to be doing until I come back. In Matthew 28, verse 20, we read these words. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. People tend to remember those last words. And I am sure these disciples remembered these last words. I am sure that they hung to those last word promises for the rest of their life. Remember the very first thing that Jesus had said to most of these disciples was simply, follow me. He would find them in a crowd. He would find them doing something. And he would point at them and say, follow me. And they left everything and followed him. Now the last thing that he says to them is, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. I am sure they remembered those two, those two, both first and last things that he said to them. And think about these disciples. How terrified would they be? Most of these disciples only understood about 50 miles from their hometown. 
But they knew the world was bigger than that 50-mile radius. They knew that the world was a big and vast place. And there was lots of people. And what Jesus had just given them is, you take this message that i have given you, the good news that I have come to die for the sins of mankind, and you take that to the world. To the world. To the world. That is an intimidating concept. You take this message, not just to your neighbor, not to the people down the street, not to the people in your city or your state, but to the world. That is a fearful task. How would they ever be able to accomplish this on their own? And I'm sure that they looked at each other when Jesus was saying these things, like, who are we to take this message to the world. To the world? And yet Jesus gave them a promise. But I am going to be with you always to the end of the age. You know, I know that some people think we're living in the end of the age. But we're not there yet. The end has not come. We might be in the end times, but it hasn't happened yet. Therefore, the promise that the Lord is going to be with us until the end of the age, I think is still valid, don't you? I think he's still with us in this task of taking the message of Christ to all the world, right? He's still equipping us. He's still, he's still with us on this task of taking this message to the world to the end of the age. That's his promise. And he's going to be with his people, his church, and to each of us until the end of our days. You know, Jesus doesn't see us dying on the, on the deathbed and say, well, they're gone or almost gone, so I'm going to leave them. He doesn't say that. He says, I will be with you always. Because we know that those of us who have trusted Christ as our Savior, that this world is not the end. He is with us after this life is over. He was with us always. So let's make this message about Jesus with us more personal, okay? And let's look at Jesus and you. And again, I mentioned this last week that normally my outlines, my messages are about us or we because we're in this thing called life together. But sometimes we need to make it personal. Jesus and you. And when it comes to Jesus talking to his disciples, just as we saw it as the Lord talked to Joshua, Jesus never backed away from telling them the truth. Even when they couldn't understand it, even when they didn't want to hear it, he was pretty straightforward with truth as he told them uh, the facts of life and the facts of ministry. And so that's what we're going to look at today. In Joshua, uh, excuse me, John chapter 16, verse 32, we read these words. Behold, the hour is coming, and indeed has come, when you will, you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that you may, may have peace, that, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I want to contrast something that Jesus said there to his disciples, but in turn, he's also said those to us. Do you notice what those are? In me, you will have peace. In me. Those of us who have trusted Christ as our Savior, we have the promise of peace. If, you're not, if you've not trusted Christ in your Savior, you can't claim a promise that's not yours. The only thing you can hold to is that second promise, which is, in the world, you will have tribulation. In the world. The word tribulation is an interesting word. As a verb, now here it's used as a noun, but as a verb, it means to crush to press, to compress, to squeeze, even to break something. We normally think of tribulation as just hard times. 
But the word means to squeeze or to press or even to break something. We would say that it pushes us to the point to be afraid of that, right? I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be in those kind of situations. It's used to describe an affliction, a hard time, an oppression, a distress. And more generally, it's described pressure or being pressed together into something that you don't want to experience. It's something that is to be, af- to be afraid of that we shouldn't be looking forward to. And Jesus said, in this world, you will have that. That is what you're going to have in this world. You're going to have things to be afraid of in this world. And most of us who have lived life, we know there are things in this life that we can and should be afraid of. And we know there are things in this world that we're afraid of, and we shouldn't be afraid of those. But in Christ, we can have peace. Whatever reality you're facing right now, whatever fearful situation that you're looking at on your horizon, whatever trouble, whatever distress is yet to come in your life, we can celebrate today because Jesus is with us today. And he will be with us in that tomorrow that comes. Whenever that fearful thing, that thing that is distressing, whatever that tribulation might be, He's going to be with us then as well. Notice what he says in verse 33. Take heart. That is very similar to what the Lord had promised Joshua back in Joshua chapter 1. Take heart. Don't be discouraged. Don't be fearful. Don't be afraid. Take heart. I am with you always. Always. No matter what difficulty that you get into, no matter what seems impossible in your life, we have a promise that God is bigger than those things. Now the question is, and like I talked about last week, we have a choice to make. Are we ch- going to choose to hold to his promise, or are we going to hold to, his, to our own feelings? The feelings that we have of being afraid. Are we going to hold to the feeling that we are secure in Christ, that we're safe in Him, that we're loved by Him. It's got to be a feeling. I know it starts in the head. It starts with the knowledge of knowing that we are His, but it's got to be brought down to the heart where we feel the security, we feel the love, we feel the safety that's found in our Savior. We stand with the one who's already overcome the world. He's already overcome the greatest challenges that we might ever face. He is the one that's promised to be with us always. I want to point out something before I close, and this is is interesting. The secret of Moses' success was not that he was trained in Pharaoh's school, you know, the greatest schools of Egypt. That was not the secret of his success. The secret of of Moses' success was that he knew that he always had God with him. It was the presence of God, that God was with him. And the secret of Joshua's success and how Joshua was able to take the children of Israel into the promised land to possess it was the same fact. And it was the same feeling that the Lord was always with him. The continued secret to the success of the Lord's church is that the Lord is with us. The Lord is with his church. And the Lord is with his people. He is with you and I if we've accepted Christ as our Savior. He is with us. And that will be the secret of our success, our sanctification, our likeness of Christ, our victory over fear is the knowledge and the feeling that I am secure in Christ, that I am safe in him, that I am loved by him, that he cares for me. That will be the secret of my victory over fear in my life. That I've never been abandoned, I've never been orphaned by the Lord. That he loves me. We have a choice to make. Will we choose that? So in closing, I just want to share with you that Jesus is always with us. That is a, that is a fact that most 
Christians that have read their Bible, they know up here. Yeah, we, we know Jesus is with us. He promises to be with us. But remember, fear is a, an emotion. It is a heart issue. And the only remedy for a heart issue is another heart issue, to know and to feel the security and safety that we have in Christ. And that's why the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. He could say those words because he understood, he felt the security that he had in Christ. And when we have that feeling, when we have that not just knowledge, but that understanding here that he is with me, that he is, that I am safe in him, that I don't have to fear anything. When we know that the Savior of mankind is committed to standing with us through every trial, every season, every affliction, and literally everything that might cause us fear, we can walk with a little bit more get up in our, get, get up in our giddy, or what? how do you say it? Or get up in our ga- gallop, whatever. All right, you know it better than me. Good. We can have a little bit more pep in our step, right? We can have a little bit more sparkle in our eye. And again, I'm talking about the unhealthy kind of fear. I'm not talking about the, the healthy kind of fear. I'm talking about the unrealistic kind of fear that we're talking about. We can, when we realize that the Lord is with us, we don't have to fear those things. We can be a little more bold in our moves, in our walk of life. And it's not that fear and anxiety and worry and doubt and those kind of distresses, not that they're not real, because we know they're real. At least they're real in our head. And sometimes they're real in our heart, right? Even if they're unrealistic, they're real to us. They're our reality if we're fearful. But when we know that they have a proper place, and that's in the hands of the Lord, when we keep recognizing what is unhealthy fear in our life, and when we keep pointing it out, no, Lord, that, I know that's unhealthy. That's an unhealthy kind of fear. And I give it back to you. When I exercise Holy Spirit self-discipline, when I reach out to you in, in, in prayer and, and confess those things, when we remember that the Lord is with us every minute, every step of our life, then we can have victory over fear. Now, I can't give you the audible voice of God like Moses heard, like Joshua heard, like the disciples heard that day. But I can give you the words of Scripture, and I can give you the words that the Lord has been speaking through the Holy Spirit to His people for the last 2,000 plus years. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Do not fear. Fear not, for I am with you always. That is what we can claim as a promise as children of God. Amen? Maybe the next time you get into an unhealthy fear situation, maybe simply open your Bible to Joshua chapter 1 and read that for yourself. And instead of Joshua's name there, insert your name. Because the Lord is with you. Do not be discouraged. Do not be fearful. Take courage, for the Lord your God is with you. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you that you give us promises in your word, that you love us, that you want us safe and secure in your mighty hands, that you are always with us. And whatever distresses, whatever problems, whatever challenges that we have in our life, we never have to go through those alone because you were always with us. And Lord, help us to take the truth of that from our head and apply it to our hearts. Apply that truth to our hearts so that we feel your love, your security, your safety for whatever might come today or in our tomorrows. In Jesus' name, amen.